Okay, so first of all, the testing, the, the, the assessment that I'm undergoing today is, a, it's not a test, it's a, uh, an adaptive software product that we have invested in that uh, assesses where kids are on reading comprehension and language arts, which is grammar and sentence structure and all those kind of rules, and on their math, <coughs> math skills. And so what it's looking for are things like uh, if you moved three times when they're in the third grade and so they never really got their multiplication tables down, it will catch things like that. Um, if you, um, you know, if, if there was a year when they were sick and didn't do any reading at all, you know, it would catch things like that. So it's really looking for uh, finding where students are and everyone's scores come out really different. Uh, we've been surprised by everyone that we've seen so far and we literally have kids whose scores are coming from you know, fifth grade reading level to twelfth grade reading level and uh, I'm a lot in between. So uh, we're just really trying to collect that data and it's very exciting inside the school to have hard data and information about students, uh, both their abilities and where gaps are. Because then, instead of saying, gee, this student doesn't seem to be doing that great in World Civ, we can say, well, gee, their reading level is this and this is where the gaps are and let's fill those in so that they can do well in World Civ or English or anything else. So we're very excited to have this tool. Uh, the assessment is not about passing, it's not about getting a certain kind of score. When they get home, leave them alone, you know, set them alone and say, okay, finish up your test, but do not intervene. Don't be leaning over their shoulders saying, um, oh, you know that one, remember? You just do this and this, because we don't want, we don't want to assess what you know, <laughs> or how well they do when their parent is leaning over the shoulder. We want to assess, uh, we really want to know what they don't know. So we're really trying to figure that out. So uh, let them share with us what they don't know. So let me talk a little bit about what exactly uh, Research Triangle High School is about. Uh, how many of you came to the open house, one of the open houses that we had? So most of you, but not single everybody. So I'll just repeat a few things. This is a college preparatory school. There are several different tracks. I think there are four of them that the state of North Carolina authorizes a student to progress through in high school. And when they enter high school, they choose which one they want. We are only one of those, and that is college preparatory. Uh, that means we have a rigorous <coughs> curriculum. It also means that we do not have the other pathways. So if after a year or so, you discover that your child is never gonna pass Algebra One, or you really would like them to go you know, into a technical kind of career, technical pathway, we don't offer that here. So this would not be a long-term match for your child, but we're certainly happy and welcome you to work with them until that gets figured out if it does. Um, on the other hand, the, um, our curriculum is very rigorous. It's four years of math, it's four years of science, which most high schools in the state don't require, beginning with biology and then chemistry, environmental science, and physics. We will work with every student that is willing to work with us to get them through those courses, and we're excited at the challenge of doing that. But it is a, a more rigorous curriculum than most schools have. Uh, some of the support that we offer for students, this year we had extensive tutoring going on in the building. We recruited and have recruited even more tutors from industry around us and uh, people have come in and dedicated an hour a week to coming in and working with a small group of kids on their math or biology skills and uh, did that quite extensively. Next year we're also going to be redesigning the curriculum. Part of the assessment is if kids do come to us with lower scores, you know, if they're a year and a half or, or more, we haven't quite set the bar in their reading or in their math preparation. Um, we're going to put them in a special section and do really intense intervention. So we work a lot with kids to, to move them fast. And of course, um, on the other side of that, I mean, a lot of the kids are testing out already at 11th, 12th grade reading and um, especially reading ability. Any of us who took their kids to the library all summer long, like I did, um, their, their reading scores are really high. And so it's great to know that. Then we can put them in accelerated classes, we can give them accelerated material, and we'll know ahead of time who can really go further and faster um, and really be able to offer up that kind of curriculum. <coughs> so uh, we're sort of doing interventions at both ends of the spectrum. So one of the things that it's important to talk about is uh, who succeeds at Research Triangle High School and who doesn't. And it all comes down to one criteria. And uh, you know, I've talked about how we have kids with all different kinds of scores coming in. 
uh, the, the factor that separates the men from the boys and the girls from the women is their willingness to do their homework every single night. And it's not about 30% of that or 50%. If they do all of their work every single night, even if they come cognitively delayed in some way or academically delayed, they will be able to progress through this school and we will help with them and work with them to progress through this school. Um, students who do not do their work do very poorly here and frankly fail and it's a big shock for them. A lot of students don't realize that you can fail ninth grade because maybe they sweet talk their way through middle school. Uh, we will fail students who don't do their work and don't turn their homework in and um, I, I can't imagine there's much worse than failing ninth grade after being sweet talking your way through middle school. So uh, that's really the, the primary difference. Um, it's about willing to meet us halfway and we will give all kinds of resources and attention to students who you know want it and need it but uh, they've got to have that work ethic. Um, another thing that happens here at uh, Research Triangle High School is a lot of experiential learning and Mr. Grennan's going to talk about uh, the our whole digital program and flipped um, but we have adopted a a lot of different things in experiential learning from project-based learning out of the New Tech Network and out of Napa Valley and the Flex Day program at Raleigh Charter and there are lots of opportunities for kids to really experience what's going on around us at Research Triangle Park to work with a scientist to present to scientists and engineers and technology IT kind of people uh, it's a really wonderful environment for the kids and I think we've really seen them mature which was exactly our intention when we adopted that kind of curriculum is to be able to both <laughs> more laptops that was a hand hand signal that said more laptops um, oh so we adopted the the digit the blend of a digital curriculum and experiential specifically so that uh, students would both as we've said many times learn the stuff that you need to learn in high school and how to be a really good student and how to be prepared for college but also learn the skills the work skills and the collaboration skills and the problem solving skills <coughs> that both the work world and college really wants to see we've had many college professors uh, come in here and talk to us and say that they are getting really tired of getting what they call just high performing drones that are coming into the classes and saying just give us the material I don't even want to come to class I just want to memorize the stuff you're giving me and get an A so I can get into XYZ grad school that's not actually what colleges are looking for and professors are very frustrated at getting these kinds of students and we are working very intentionally here to deliver or <laughs> to deliver a product to, to educate young kids so that they are, are broadly educated and, and not just little, you know, let me memorize this stuff and perform well on a test. That is not what we're trying to do here. So, uh, expectations of students, of students, expectation of parents, since this is your orientation. I'm kind of undone by the camera, hi there. Um, so that I have, let's see, one, two, three, four, five and a half kind of things. So let me just run through them. First is keep up with your students' grades on their, our online uh, gradebook. So this year it's uh, something called ThinkWave. We think that we're going to transition to the state supply thing called Power School, uh, but that transition is a little bit up in the air this summer because you know because it's dependent on the state adopting a whole new system and that might not be completely timely. The state is convinced it's going to happen. Let's <laughs> you know, all be residents of the state. We're a little more jaded. But whatever happens, we will have an online grade book. And your role is not to look at, you know, to log in and say, oh my gosh, you didn't get a, you know, you got an A, a minus, you didn't get an A plus, or you, you know, you got a B plus, you didn't get an A minus. Your role is to look at that and, and look for the holes in the grade book. So your job is to say, oh, Johnny, you didn't uh, do this assignment on this Tuesday, and you didn't do that on that Thursday, and you're missing things. And don't get too focused on the grades, because that is the job of the teacher and the student. But yours is to create that structure and that continuity on delivering uh, all of the work. So that's a great place to do it, is to log into the online gradebook. You can also look at your students' homework and classwork on Moodle, which we will have next year. That's our learning management system. All of their curriculum is loaded on there. And you can log in under your students. Do they get their own login or under the students' login? I think we get their own. 
Anyway, you can log in one way or another. And to look at all of that curriculum too, you can also uh, sit side by side with a student and learn algebra again, or biology again, or whatever you want, and watch all of the videos and uh, look at all the assignments, which is actually great if you are wanting to help your, your child with, with their homework, to be able to have the material and say, well, here's, here's what she said, you know, here's how she said to do these problems, and here's where she said to take some notes. Have you taken the notes? And, you know, you can really be a coach there if you want to. You just stay far, far enough ahead of them that they, they look at you with more awe, you know. Because usually this is about the time the parents start to age out of being able to help with the homework, and so you can just keep that facade yeah. going. You can watch it at midnight the night before, and they right. won't know that you don't know algebra still. Um, number three, be responsive to emails from the school. The primary and probably almost only way that we communicate with people in this community is through emails. There's a weekly newsletter that the PTSO puts together, but we're feeding them content. Um, every once in a while, pretty regularly, we send out our own announcements to uh, the whole community about one thing or another. All of the communications on things like grade, you know, grade reports are coming out, report cards are coming, the exam schedule, uh, we need drivers for flex days, all of those things come electronically. So if you don't check your emails, if you put us on permanent delete, as we are all wont to do, uh, you will miss out on things. And I mean, a great example is our exams began this week, and I had two parents the first day of the week come up to me and say, so, you know, when are exams and what is the schedule? I'm like, oh my gosh, we have sent that out, you know, probably five times. And they didn't know that the exams were from 9 to noon, and they need to pick their kids up at noon. So that kind of thing we really, really want you to keep on top of because there's no other way to communicate with you. Uh, a fourth thing that can be your role as a member of this community and parent of a child here is to volunteer. We don't have our PTSO representatives today, um, so if, uh, if they were, they would like swoop down and want you to do all kinds of things. But a primary thing that you can do as a parent is driving for our flex days. We take the kids out a couple of times a year to the industry around us, and we can easily need 40 or even 60 drivers on a given day. So that's a great opportunity for you to use some of your PTO, get inside the school, experience what the kids are, you know, a learning environment for them, see them in their natural habitat with their friends, see the teachers running around corralling everybody, and, uh, and meet you know, all of your, your fellow parents. So it's a great opportunity to do that. You can also, on certain days when we have presentations, the students are expected to dress professionally, you know, professionally for a 14-year-old. And so you can help them, you know, figure out what that is and what's kind of dressed up but not party dress and that kind of thing. Uh, chaperoning for any of the events that we, that's going to grow. We had two or three dances this year and I'm sure that that will continue to grow. And the last kind of expectation for parents and a role that you can take on is encouraging your student to join things in their freshman year. A lot of kids kind of hold back and try to figure out, you know, what am I really affiliated with? Who's the crowd that I want to be with? Encourage them to try something. By Christmas, every student really should be trying out one club or, and I will see, even say club, the kids who get into sports, they should also consider the activities too, so that they have that, they begin to have those experiences of learning what they like and don't like. Um, I think that's my whole list. The only other thing I wanted to say something was about group work. All of the students, because we do project-based learning, it's actually a very structured, uh, defined process. All of the students are in a constantly evolving set of groups. They can be on a group project in, in a group for one day. They can be in a group that lasts for three weeks. Uh, the first half of the year, we get a lot of calls and inquiries from parents because, of, as you can imagine, they're all saying, my student's in a group and the other people aren't pulling their weight and he's you know, miserable and it's horrible. And um, we ask that you just uh, live within that discomfort and that process because we're very aware of that. The teachers are aware and they are teaching the kids what it's like to work and how to work in a group. So that discomfort that they're experiencing and expressing to you is, is normal and it's being taken care of here, uh, but the kids are learning and, and they don't know yet. And, but by about Christmas, all of that really calms down. The, the kids begin to understand what their roles are. The kids who do not step up kind of get um, a little bit ostracized and learn that they have got to step up and, uh, and then we continue on and, and you see wonderful presentations and projects that come out of here. The walls would normally be covered with things, but because 
exams are going on, everything had to be come down so they couldn't get any little clues by walking by a project. So, all right, so now I think this is Eric Grundon, who's our chief school officer, and he's gonna talk academically much in much more depth. Yeah, I wanna say one other thing about uh, clubs and activities. This is a very young school, obviously, and we have a few clubs now, and those clubs are gonna, those club options are gonna grow. We're trying to support student interest in clubs, so as students come up to me and say, oh, we want to have an anime club, or we want to have a, you know, FCA group, or we want to have something else. I'm generally supportive of that, and I have a little process that they have to go through uh, to get approval for it. But the thing that is probably most useful to you about, uh, and to, to them in a very pragmatic way, is that when you're starting at a new school that doesn't have a club, you can start a club, and you can show leadership in ways that you don't or can't if you go to a place that has an established program. So when you're filling out a college application, building your resume later on, you say, I started the blank club and you know whatever, and it grew to you know 50 members by the time I graduated. That's huge, as opposed to I was a part of a club that already existed. So um, that's a good thing to encourage them to do as well. So we're, we are generally pretty supportive of that. So I am the, uh, the principal and chief school officer, and it's my job to make people unhappy every day. <laughs> so if I'm doing my job, there will be unhappy people around. <laughs> so I, I want to try to use some of that unhappiness because it will be visited upon you, unfortunately, when uh, the students come home and they say, well, this happened today, or I have to call you about something. So let me say a few things. Um, first, bef uh, we'll talk about homework just for a minute. Uh, people always ask how much homework every night, and that the answer to that question is, is not simple. Um, when I say, we expect te teachers will probably give about, or we would expect students to have to do about an hour and a half of homework a day. That's kind of the target that we're looking for, which is something on the order of 15 to 20 minutes of class, depending on how you slice that. That doesn't seem like a whole lot. Um, we understand that we're trying to help students as well develop some concept of school life balance and not have to come home and immediately don't do homework all night. So they have a study hall during the day, that's an hour, virtually an hour of time that they can, uh, they can work with us here. Uh, but you should expect about that much. Now, I've been at schools that have really super high ability students who you can just look at and they'll learn whatever you're teaching. And they have the same problems doing homework that I see here. Uh, and that is, I get phone calls from parents who say, my son was home last night, my daughter was home last night, and spent four or five hours working on the homework. I guarantee you that if that much time is being taken doing homework, it's not being done right. So, Oftentimes, students will say, yes, I'm working on my homework. And that statement is true, but there's a lot around that statement that's not being said, which is, I had five other windows open on my screen while I was trying to watch the video. So I was watching the video, and I was texting, I was chatting, and I was updating my Facebook profile, doing all those other things. So um, we advocate the dark, painted black cardboard box in the middle of the living room where the students have you know, no other distractions they're very close to supervise. This is the approach that we want to take. Um, when I say that students should not take that much time doing homework every night, there may be a legitimate reason why that's happening. And we need to know what that is. But what we don't want to have happen is students not to progress far enough with their assignments at night, they come in the next day, and they're behind. Uh, and that deflates the whole purpose of the flip model. And the great things about the flip model is that we can take the sitting and listening to somebody and writing down notes part out of the regular school day, and we're wasting a teacher's time by making them do that, Put it, in the, put it in the computer and have a look at it at home. They come in the next day and they're doing these great engagement activities, you know, higher order thinking and collaborative learning and all these things that are what colleges and, and workplace want these days. But if we have to go back and reteach what should have been seen the night before, that you know, takes away a section of that. So uh, please monitor how the students are doing homework. We're working with that as well with them in our, our study hall curriculum this year, which is gonna be a lot more structured than it's been, than it was this past year. And we're gonna try and teach them a lot about how to do homework in the digital age. Um, and, and one thing we're trying to do really is teach students to be responsible with all of those resources. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. But that's what we want to see happen. So we're going for an hour and a half of homework a night. If it's less than that, you might want to check to make sure it's being done right and complete. Uh, then there's the whole turning in the homework part, which is totally different. Uh, and that's another thing we may have to have talk about. Right now. But that's, that's how you can check it out. And you can see those things in Moodle. You can see those things in, uh, in, in whatever the grade book is, Power School. Um, and, and I would say really that there, there might be a lag from time to time because teachers are people, they're very busy, they might not get the homework assignments graded and uploaded as quickly as we would like. So you may look, you know, the day something was turned in and it says it's not turned in, don't 
don't uh, uh, meet and call a teacher about that and get a little bit of time to make sure that those things are, are, are happening. Uh, let's see, so uh, we are trying to find out from our students how they are doing. And if we find that there are students who are spending a lot of time on homework every night, it may be that we need to intervene in some other way. And we intervene in several ways. Uh, one, the assessment that's going on right now, we're trying to figure out where all of our students are. We want to be accountable to each student grade-wise, and so we want to be able to say at the end of the year, look, they start here, they end it here, that's improvement. We also want to know exactly what a student's strengths and weaknesses are so that we can target those. We have tutors that are available, they're both regular teachers and volunteers. Uh, we will, ask, we will I mean, force students to go to tutoring as much as we can. We assign them to a tutor that will work here. Um, and there are other things that can be done as well, but there are steps that we will take here at the school. We are trying to support every student, and even if a student comes in uh, you know, with a, a weak background in a subject or whatever, we still want to show that that student will be accountable and will, be, uh, will achieve over the course of the year, will grow in whatever subject. And so on top of all that is this idea that we want to be stretching students all the time. Anybody, no matter what they bring to the table, we want them to work a little bit harder. Stress is good, a little bit, not too much. Like I said, we're trying to work with balance. But at the same time, we also want to make sure that our students are feeling stretched every day. They're feeling challenged every day. And that challenge is a little bit difficult to target until we get to know a student really well. So um, I would say ignore the first little bit of complaining every day about how hard it was. And you know, note if it's common and it happens all the time and it's starting to affect other aspects of the child's life. But otherwise, they'll get used to it. So that's academically what I wanted to talk about there. Um, our teachers are the interface between the stuff and the students, right? We want them to get this. So we've gone out and we've hired really fantastic teachers and uh, we are trying to put them in front of students and letting them do this in the way that they feel is most efficient. You uh, may want to talk to teachers from time to time. We encourage that. You probably will want to. Uh, and uh, any dialogue is, is helpful and great. And we want that to happen. We want you to feel comfortable enough to be able to go to a teacher and say, I don't understand this, or I have a question about this. The teacher will talk to you. However, they're very busy during the day. And we don't want you to feel that your time has been wasted. So we don't want you just to kind of drop in during the day and try and meet the teacher. It's very difficult to line up schedules. Please call the office. Please try and schedule an appointment. You can call the teacher directly or email the teacher directly um, in any, you know, some other way and set up that, those appointments. They will be happy to meet with you. Even our part-time teachers who have uh, more restrictive schedules, that will still happen. Uh, we don't want you to, um, oh yeah, that's the other thing. We'd like you to contact the teachers through the office or directly after hours to make appointments rather than showing up. We also want to um, be sure that we are part of the line of communication that you have with the, the building. Um, if you feel the need to contact your student during the day, we ask that you call the office and have us relay messages or have us get the students, bring them out of class. We need to be a part of that loop because we need to know A, the students are going, and B, why they're going. Um, consequently, or conversely, if I have a student who's not feeling well and happens to have their phone and texts on and says, hey, I don't feel good, can you come pick me up? We want to know about that too because if I have a student who's sick enough to leave the building, I want to know that because from a safety and security perspective, I need to know if that kid is patient zero and we're going to end up with an epidemic that's going to you know, take the school out for a week. <laughs> And, and also, as you've seen, this is a fairly open campus, and it's not unusual for parents to kind of drive up to the front and take care of the business and leave. And uh, I don't want a student to go home with a parent without us knowing, and then you know, an hour or two later, I'm frankly running around the building trying to find this person who they left. So uh, we don't mean to inconvenience you, but we do need a part of that communication loop. Also, students, they love you, and whether you see it or not, and they respect when you have something to say to them. And so if I have a student who's trying to do the right thing and sitting in the classroom with their phone in their pocket, and suddenly the phone vibrates, and they kind of steal a glance down and they see it's you, they're going to want to answer that. They feel that's really important, and that takes them out of class. And I don't want to see that happen, so if you could go through the office instead of contacting them directly, that would be great. <laughs> uh, Technology-wise, so um, we have a practical ban on phones during the school day. Uh, phones are okay before and after school and at lunch, but otherwise we don't want to see them. We'll take them away. We may ask you to not send the phone to the school with the child if, the, uh, if that's a problem. We may have students, well, well, we have some now, who in the morning come in, drop their phone at the front desk, go to class, at the end of the day come back, pick it up and go home. Because it's a very distracting thing. It's very tempting to have that in your hand. And, uh, 
I've always, I'm always amazed when I see students, and I've, I've been a chemistry teacher for 17 years, so I've seen a lot of students in a lot of areas, but I'll see them get phone calls and texts from other students at other schools during the day. You know, this is happening now twice. <laughs> you know, it's not just I have a student here who's responding to a text. I have somebody in another school someplace who is doing this live, so we don't want to see that happen. We thought originally that we would be able to use phones more, and the flip model was pioneered in some places where uh, that was the way it was done. All the videos were easily accessible and students were watching them, but that's all they were doing is watching. And then doing a lot of work on paper, so that worked. But we're doing a lot of document creation here. And you can't really type an essay on a phone. You could, but it'd be awful, and it'd take a really long time. So we all have, everybody's got laptops, and so we've kind of pushed the phone to the margin. Uh, every now and then they have utility, and sometimes teachers will say, sure, kids go to music or whatever, but uh, otherwise we want them put away. We don't generally block a lot of things that other places block. We block what's required by law, uh, what's required by our, our, um, our agreements with the state and the federal government, so all the really scary and nasty things that nobody can get to. Uh, but we don't block Facebook, for example, we don't block Twitter. Uh, it's possible that we might do that, but at this point we don't want to, and it's a philosophical point. We don't want students to be blocked from something when we're trying to teach them how not to go there in the first place, or how to get the homework done first and then go do the other thing. We also know that there's some value in those things. And students to be aware that they could be in a really big, bunch of trouble if they do these things. You know, they, they don't quite realize that. Uh, so as we make changes to that technology uh, platform, we will tell you, but otherwise, uh, we're trying to teach students to be responsible and be careful, and that's an incredible, incredibly difficult job, as you know, trying to teach them to be responsible and careful uh, on your own. The other place we're trying to teach students to be responsible and the other place that I make parents unhappy is dress code. We don't have so much of a very explicit dress code the way that other institutions do. You will see it when the when the student handbook comes home. It's about this long, maybe a paragraph or so in the in the, in the course or in the handbook, and it has some explicit rules like don't wear underwear on the outside, or you know, or don't wear, uh, uh, don't bring, you know, carry a sword, don't wear T-shirts with with uh, offensive material and things like that. But we're not going to be going around measuring skirt length rules. Uh, we don't want to see excessively tight or revealing clothing, which is the operative phrase in most cases. Uh, we know that you see your students who after they dress and come to school and you give them tacit approval by that, and, uh, and, and I don't mean to second guess your parental role, but sometimes the standards that we have in school are different than yours. And the way that we will deal with that is by taking the student aside and saying, thank you for being here, but next time please don't wear that. You know, wear something a little bit, you know, we'll explain why. Uh, and that's a group effort that's taken on by the teachers throughout the school. We talk to each other and go, what do you think about that? And they say, oh, no, maybe we shouldn't. And, you know, we, we have a little bit of a debate before we get there because it's kind of a gray area. We're trying to teach students to make good choices about dress. It doesn't have to be slacks and a dress and tie and, and stuff every day. Uh, when we say professional, we mean that you know, here's professional and here's teenager and we're somewhere in there, you know, kind of on the way to, to that. We want students to be comfortable. We also want them to have ready to uh, impress people who come to visit. You know, we'll have uh, people from the area who might be hiring them one day or, or looking for interns one day. Or uh, otherwise, we just want to impress. So we want them to, to be uh, uh, careful about those things. And the way that will work is we will tell the student, and the student will probably be embarrassed about it, and we're sorry that that happens. We try and counsel them. Uh, they'll tell you about it, and then hopefully the next time it doesn't happen. If it does, and it becomes a I would say a chronic problem, it becomes a conscious choice the child is making. We have some students who choose to express themselves that way. Uh, we have sweats and jackets in the office that we will loan out to them temporarily. Uh, so those are the three areas really where I tend to have most of my, I'll say for lack of a better term, negative interactions with parents is on dress code, on uh, homework and assignments, and on uh, technology issues. We have a very extensive acceptable use policy as you all saw and signed. Uh, and there's a lot in there about what you can get in trouble for and what the potential penalties are. It's rare that we have students that intentionally go too far with that. But we are watching. We're very, very good at catching students who do go too far. Uh, and, and you might drop that hint. We don't disclose just how good we are at it. There's a lot more that we know about what students are doing than they know. And when we feel that a line has been crossed, we pull a student aside and say, hey, here's what happened, and we know, and give them a chance to confess. Uh, 
um, but we know. So in any case, that's kind of the that's that's my unhappy speech about about things you need to be aware of. Oh, I guess one other thing is um, arrival and departure times in the afternoon. So the school is open from 7:30 to 5, and uh, we know that there are parents who are going to drop students off in the morning and pick them up at night. That's great, no problem. Uh, the time between 7:30 and 9, we usually have uh, we have teachers here. They can help out with students if they need uh, uh, help with homework or if they want to do homework before school, something like that. In the afternoon, we have the same thing going on. We have a, a, a study hall area for students to go into. They can get help. They might meet with clubs. There's all kinds of things they could be doing at that time. What we don't want is a large number of students just kind of roaming around the campus. And so for bus riders, we tend to we, we escort them to their buses as quickly as possible to get them home as early as they can. Uh, for students who are being carpooled or picked up, we want them picked up as quickly as possible. Uh, anytime after 5 o'clock, we have a contract with a cab company and we will send students home by cab and send an invoice to the parents uh, should we have to do that. We uh, are here a lot during the day and most of us have families at home and need to get home and pick up kids and you know a lot like you do. And so um, it's, it's, it's kind of disappointing on the nights that we're here until 6.30 or so uh, waiting for a parent to pick up a student. So we want that to, to happen. Um, yeah. So school starts at 9, dismissal is at 3.55. We may change that bell schedule a little bit next year. Uh, we're, we know we're going to shorten lunch a little bit because it's too long right now. Uh, it won't, the, day, the school day will not be any less than 15 minutes shorter. I can say that for sure. And it'll probably be maybe 5 minutes, maybe 10 minutes because we're going to take some of that lunch time and possibly put it back into the school day in another form, which uh, we'll tell you about later on. Uh, in the fall, when things get started, we'll be sending home a parent handbook and a student handbook. We'll probably link to them and you can go look at them. That uh, explain uh, various procedures, uh, things like attendance policies and you know what, what you should write notes for. Any of you who've been in the public school system, you know there are seven excuses that are acceptable and you need to use one of those when you send in notes, things like that. Um, we'll talk more about that in those, in those uh, uh, handbooks, but if you don't have those, we'll be Consultant. Let me interject something Please. here because this is the first year I really worked full time in a school. So uh, all all the years before, when I worked at other other charters, I was um, still my primary role was a parent. So I had no idea the depth of the obsession with the parent signed note over absences. This is like regulated by state statute, uh, literally. And so all those years that I would like grab an envelope and write, Stephen was out because they went to the orthodontist and I always want to put, for heaven's sakes, can't is that clear, you know, Pamela. Um, oh my gosh, I mean, schools have been closed for the lack of the parent signed note over absences. This is a major, major deal. It's the first procedure that he put into place and uh, has obsessed over. And, uh, you know, we live and die by what the General Assembly says and that is one of the primary regulations. So. Even though as a parent it seems like a really annoying thing, I always thought it was really silly. I mean, you can tell, you know, you should have to take my word for it that my child went to the orthodontist. But no, you have to write it down and it has to go in our permanent records and uh, it has to be auditable. You know, if auditors were to come, they would literally look for, do we have notes for all these absences? So it's just one of those things that uh, from our perspective is an obsessive detail and from yours is an annoying one. Is the email okay? No. Really has to be yeah. Yeah. Child has to walk in with a. We'll be typed and signed or something like that. Like the, and in a pinch, we might. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we need something with a signature. That's the important thing. The back of the envelope really is fine. It actually would work, yeah. <laughs> and really, and I don't want to get too technical here, but really the law is. No, I shouldn't tell you that. Never mind. <laughs> it's lengthy. Let's say that. Wanna, the law is lengthy. I don't want to encourage anything. So. Yeah. The other uh, little piece I wanted to say about social media and um, communication with families and, and students using social media inside the school. One of my favorite stories is this last January when we had that sudden ice day you know, that was unpredicted and schools were going to close at noon and then they closed at 10 and all that. Um, I had the, the lucky pleasure of being here while he was out somewhere and being in charge that day and I think we also had four teachers out that day. It was a really special experience. <laughs> But anyway, people started saying it's you know it's icing in Durham at you know at 10 a.m. So I thought, how on earth am I going to tell all of these parents that it's icing in Durham and, and we're going to dismiss even earlier than we planned? So I posted it on Facebook. Come get your kids when you can. 
because we're going to release them as you get here. Within 60 seconds, the children were out of their classrooms coming to the front office saying, we hear school is closing now. So I'm like, well, I would rather if your parents been watching Facebook rather than you. So, uh, so that tells us a lot about, first of all, you should, if you're not a Facebook user, we communicate extensively through Facebook. That's where all of our real time communication happens. At the same time, that's another reason why we're going to kind of clamp down on the kids' use of Facebook inside the school because they should not have known within 60 seconds in the middle of a class period what I was trying to share with their parents. Oh, that <laughs> brings up an important point. Uh, I live in southern Wake County, and uh, the weather here is very different than it is down there in the winter, or at least that was the case this year. Um, and, and so those of you who are Wake County residents, we tend to follow, I mean, when we set up our calendars, we generally follow the Wake, the Wake County traditional oh, okay. calendar because Durham is weird. No offense to any of you who come from Durham, but I can't really wrap my head around the Durham Public Schools calendar. And, and I, so. Um, so, but, but in, in terms of canceling school or closing school or having a weather delay or something like that, um, there can be a big difference between what happens in Durham and what happens here. And so, I mean, what happens there, what happens in Wake County. So um, just be aware of that. We watch the weather for the school area uh, and see what happens. And um, we tend to look at the schools that are around us, like Castro Heights, and, and uh, which is just down the road, and, and a couple other schools that are that are in this general area as to what the weather conditions are like. And we have some teachers who live really, really close to here, and so I'll call them in the morning and say, hey, what's it look like? Uh, but we tend to look and see what Durham does. Because so. you know the weather comes from the west and starts coming this way, so we've got to attend to what's happening. Durham first. So we should follow the Wake County schedule, but also pay attention to what Durham's doing too. No, Durham just for the way our way. calendar, once our calendar, and our calendar is on the website, so please follow our calendar. Uh, when we're planning our calendar, we tend to look at, at Wake. It's very similar to the, to the Wake traditional calendar, but, um, uh, but we start you know, two weeks earlier and all that. But yeah, for weather-wise, um, I would look to Durham, but um, we'll publicize all of that. Okay. Both Facebook, Twitter, I mean, we're all in the WRAL. It's all in the handbook. You'll see it. Okay. Nobody will be surprised. I, I think we had one family show up once on the day that school closed. Uh, the only other thing that I was going to say before we finish is that um, it's our, but usually about 4:30 <coughs> on Fridays is when our pest control people come, and uh, they can't spray the building with uh, well, as long as there are students in it. So we ask that as soon as your students are done. If take them through, that would be great. Um, they should be coming out in the next 10 minutes to, to 30 minutes. We're not, we're not forcing anybody to work faster. We want this, this is a, a very natural assessment. We want it to be a, an honest, level-headed, you know, baseline. Um, so we're not forcing anybody to leave, but we just don't want to stay around too much longer. So, so, should we get yeah. the results of that? Yes, you will get the results of that. The students will see the results. Uh, when they log in, so they should, they should say. Um, and then if we need to send you something more formal, we'll do that later. Kind of They'll get a number, and the number is, did you talk about this at all? No. So the number will be something like, uh, you know, 1080, which the, the first part of it is the grade level that they're at, so the 10. Uh, and then the second part is kind of what percentage of the way are they through the year. So 1080 would be close to 11th grade, and, you know, 910 would be close to ninth grade. So it gives you an idea roughly about where they're supposed to be on, we say on grade level or not. And if you're close to that, that's pretty good. Uh, both the math and the reading assessment do kind of the same thing. The software also gives a, uh, will give a prescription. It will diagnose what it is that the weak areas were and it will say, hey, if you want to get better over the summer, here's some stuff you can do and it'll give you lessons. And so over the course of the summer, the students could, using the same account, log in and do those things and bone up a little bit on uh, things that they, they maybe are, are weak on. We're not requiring that, but it's there, and, and it's something that, that some of you may want to look at. Uh, I was going to say something else about that. Oh, also, using the, the, the login that students have for Moodle that they got in there, they can go to the same page, what's called the Raptor Nest page, N-E-S-T, uh, and on that page there will be a link to the course guide for next year, which gives descriptions of all the classes that we're offering, and also a link to the online registration form, so you can go and choose classes. Not all of the classes that are in the course guide are available to freshmen, just the way it is. And uh, but all the ones that are available to you are in the, the form, so you just pull down and check boxes and stuff like that. Uh, 
if you can do that relatively soon, that'd be great. Uh, if you have questions about that, you can email anybody at the school and we'll do that. We have been hearing from a couple of parents that there sometimes seems to be an issue with Moodle, and we're trying to figure out what that is. But um, there have been people registering online already, so we know that the form does work. Just for some reason. Is it Moodle or Noodle? Moodle with an M. Moodle. 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 Yeah. That's what I thought. <laughs> one, one issue with Moodle is it, it does, it's not terribly compatible with Chrome, so it's better to use Firefox or Explorer. And uh, we're going to take questions, but I want to go ahead and introduce Marie Clossy, who is one of our PTSO uh, parents and head of transportation. And she's here to talk to you about carpooling, organizing carpools, and that database that you entered, hopefully, information into, and also the Triangle Transit bus routes, and help people figure that out if they want to do that, or both. So, uh, no. so we're happy to take questions and let you talk to Marie. and get to know each other and find each other and that kind of thing. In terms of the appointment with the teachers, I think you mentioned you know, that the best time to call to the office or directly to the teacher after hours. You mean between uh, 4 and 5 then? The school finish at 4 o'clock, so that's the best time to call 4 and 5? I would say so that or in the morning. If you call in the front office, any time is okay. If you're trying to reach a teacher directly, I would say uh, you can call any time and they will, you can leave a message with them. All of our teachers have direct <coughs> numbers, so you won't, if you call the office, uh, we're not we're not screening everything, and, and nobody in the office has the ability actually to connect you to a teacher. We use Google Voice for our cell phones, and so everybody has their own number. So you can call that number and leave a message anytime, and that will also, and that number will automatically, in some cases, not everybody's got this set up this way, but usually it will ring the teacher at teacher's cell phone other time as well. So if they're not at their desk you know, with the computer on it will ring and they'll know that they've got the message and they can answer some other way. But that's really the best way to do it. Call them anytime, and if they can answer the phone, they will, and if they can't, you can leave a message and they'll call you back at the end of the day. 